Welcome to the Cult is King podcast. I'm your host, Rambling Bones, joined by my co-host, the Duke. Salutations. And Duke, what is it that we do here? Here we watch cult movies. So there's are either movies that uh, just there have an audience that's a little more underground, not quite mainstream, or in some cases, movies that are just ridiculous. However, today uh, we have a movie that's actually fairly well critically acclaimed. Yeah, it's a real change of pace from what we normally talk about. I It was my pick, and I picked Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Cure. This Kurosawa, by the way, is in no relation to Akira Kurosawa. And there are no samurais in this movie. And there are no samurais in this movie whatsoever. This movie is a sort of crime thriller. It typically sort of gets lumped into the, the J-horror category, although it's not particularly scary, sort of how the way Silence of the Lambs isn't exactly scary. That being said, I honestly think that it's being lumped in with J-horror is not unfair. No. Uh, but we'll get into that later. Yeah, the quick synopsis, and by the way, this movie is a little complicated your first time watching it, but... The plot, sort of, kind of, is you have Detective Takabe, and he is investigating a series of murders that are all similar, but by different people. You see, what's happening is you have individuals who are, for no apparent reason, or at least no immediate apparent reason, killing people and then carving a big X on their neck chest area. And uh, the police haven't released any information about this, so it's not people copying each other. These people seem to have nothing in relation. And all of the individuals who commit the murders, their reasoning is just sort of, it was the thing to do at the time. But after, they, they aren't really sure exactly. Some of them know why they did it. Or at least some of them aren't saying that they had a a real reason to do it. But Takabe is investigating all these murders, and it leads him to an individual named Mamiya, who is this young ex-psychology student who apparently has no memory, and he likes to ask a lot of questions. And this leads Takabe to reason that through hypnotic suggestion, Mamiya is causing these murders. And that's kind of the plot. Yeah, that'll, that's enough to get us started. Before we maybe get into the particulars of plot, and I actually have a lot of questions I'd like to ask you, and we'll have a little section where we can just vamp for a few. Just a vamp? Yeah, just vamp. Is that a thing? People say that? I heard one guy say it once, and I kind of liked it. So. Okay, well, we'll vamp. We'll vamp, <laughs> we'll vamp in a vamp. second. But, uh... but let's talk about the filmmaking, actually. Yeah, so... There... One of the things I did find was I did find a um, uh, interview with Kiyoshi Kurosawa. One thing that I did notice, and this is actually the second of his films that I've seen, because I have seen the movie Pulse. You showed that to me. Yes. And one thing I find interesting is uh, he likes to do long shots without any cuts in between, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so what he does is he just has one long take and he uses it to build tension and that's one thing this movie has in spades is uncomfortable tension duke i don't know what your initial viewing thoughts were i know we didn't we watched this together for the first but you watched it for the first time with me and and we didn't exactly have the best viewing area but would you describe this movie? Where did you feel tense watching it? Yeah, there was definitely a lot of tension. It's a slow burn, but the thing is, is that like it's rarely that there's a bunch of climatic events occurring. It's more of though that just each new piece of the puzzle, each new scene just throws on a little more tension as you're going until things get pretty crazy at the end. Yeah, and the the long shots, they build the tension, but it gets to the point where it's just uncomfortable. Especially that'd be another, though, good describer for this movie is uncomfortable. Yeah, especially for me when I first saw it, since I saw it was lumped in with the J-horror, I was expecting more horrific stuff. And even if you didn't go in thinking it was a horror movie, you are really 
even though it's not a jump scare movie, it feels like every scene is waiting to have a punchline in, in the form of something horrific. I don't know. If you were to ask me, I might still consider this a horror film. Mm -hmm. But where it doesn't have maybe as many like jump scares or out and out horrific moments, I would say that it is more disturbing than most of its uh, the members of its genre. Yeah, there's a handful of moments that like most of the murders in this movie are not terribly graphic. One of them you don't even see happen, but a lot of them are, aren't terribly gruesome. But then there's one part where this doctor lady cuts off a dude's face. Well, and you have to remember that the first body we see, we just all and out see the naked woman with all of like the gore and the thing cut into her. You know what I mean? So... Yeah, the big... X across the, this the is neck, a chest area. Hopefully all of you have picked up already, but this is definitely not a movie for children. This is, And I will say, if you are easily disturbed, you should probably skip this one. Yeah. So we mentioned the long shots. Another thing about this movie is the sound. There's very little music in this movie. The music that is in there is creepy and again helps to build tension but it's a very small part of the movie it feels like where there's actually music most of the time it is either low droning ambience or natural ambience or really loud noises for example takabe's wife fumi she's got some sort of mental illness and she keeps turning on the dryer or the washing machine so that there's always this this drum going in whenever he's at home or there's a, a few scenes that take place in a hospital and the sound of a wheelchair going down a hallway instead of being the sound of a normal wheelchair it, it's like they turned up the sound to 11 and just cranked it well and then they also like to a couple times they cut to when they're at the scrapyard I think it's a scrapyard. Yeah, at. It's, uh, when they're like firing the thing that's like I don't know if it's melting stuff down or something. But... There's some sort of incinerator there, right? And so you go from these loud noises to these quiet noises. But not a lot of in between. It's usually either ambient, you know, and usually fairly quiet, or we have something like jarring. But at the very opening of the movie, you just see this murder happen, and this really light kind yeah. of happy tune is playing it, it could have been in the background of a wee menu the thing about this movie is this movie is a video essayist fantasy it's perfect for them and Except which is the... surprising because there's so few video essays on it well i find that video essayists like to take something that's not that complicated and then talk for three hours about it <laughs> and then when something's hard to think about we don't get a video essay so i there's a lot of elements that I look at with this movie, and they make me ask questions, especially since Kiyoshi Kurosawa is in that category of directors, I believe, where he's making, for the most part, pretty thoughtful decisions. So having that, I think it almost kind of comes with how the title is called The Cure, and it's, it's a deceptively simple title, and, and this music just completely catches you off guard well and maybe confuses you and that's one of the one things i do like about this movie though talking about like the director's choices is a lot of times i feel like the reason that a lot of movies or songs are so hard to dissect is not necessarily because there is a deeper meaning but because there isn't mm -hmm. and people are trying to make more of something that there is but here i feel like he really was trying to tell me something you know what i mean yeah like there's a merit to the discussion of this movie as opposed to, you know, Matt Pat making another nine hour video. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have, you know what I mean? Yeah. One funny thing though, I was, we're just saying how he's making conscious decisions. I mentioned the dryer washing machine. There's sort of a theme of emptiness in this film. And of course the washing dryer machine is always empty. Uh, I watched an interview with him and he said, how at conventions or places where he'd speak about the movie, he would talk about how it, it's an empty, the washer and dryer is empty, and that's that's on purpose. Uh, but in the interview, he said, yeah, uh, we actually just needed something that was loud, so that's what we put in the movie. 
Well, but I'm... I mean, symbolically, it works. It could it could have been worse. He could have pulled the Dario Argento and told him that this was an alternate timeline <laughs> <laughs> or something, and then made up some increasingly uh, bizarre reason about there being Nazis and an end of the world, uh, and that's why there's a. If none of this makes sense, go see one of our go see our phenomena review. Yeah. Also, we mentioned the the long shots, but there's a certain point in the movie where we suddenly start getting a bunch of quick cuts of things. With this movie, you have either ambient, quiet ambient noise or extremely loud ambient noise, really long shots or a series of almost subliminal style shots. Well, to pull out of the analysis for just a second, one thing I think was interesting is despite the fact that he's fond of having the actors there and doing a long connected take, it's funny because he said he didn't rehearse a lot of these or spend lots of time taking many, many takes. Uh, one, because he was working with film. And two, though, he describes as having a very, like, nine-to-five attitude, which is... That sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, if that sounds normal to you guys, that is not normal in the filmmaking world. People went, worked on this for a reasonable amount of time, and went home. Movies are not made that way. It also sounds, though, that he wasn't in a time crunch. But I just, I thought that was interesting, because you think that with these long shots... It would be much harder to do it in one take or oh, yeah. to do it in even a couple. And it sounds like he was able to do that. Of course, he also had some good actors to work with. Yeah. I mean, maybe if I spoke Japanese, if I, I knew a little a little more of that, uh, I could judge the acting more or less. But from my subtitle reading perspective, everybody's performance seemed great. Um, I thought so. And I'm not the only person. When he chose... Uh, Koji Yakusho to play the lead role. Um, one, that was like his first choice, and he was surprised to get it. He'd actually go on to work with him eight more times. Mm -hmm. But uh, he actually won an award for this movie. He won Best Actor at the 1997 Tokyo International Film Festival. Wow. Uh, clearly, uh, we're not the only person who thought he did a good job. I thought also that uh, Mamiya's acting was pretty good. He... He goes from looking like he's in a daze to suddenly looking like he's a little too aware of what's going on. He also has the world's most punchable expression. Oh my goodness. Which really aids in Takabe's frustration. There's a, a sort of foil between Takabe and Mamiya. Well, for one, Takabe is your... He's like a salary man. He's, you know, in his suit... He's a, a functional member of society, why Mamiya kind of looks like a young bum. Right, he has, he doesn't some, seem to have any job, he doesn't seem to have any aspirations, or even to care about anything. Whereas Takabe has two modes, uh, cold and professional, or just boiling over with anger. Yes, and they are definitely colliding with each other. But there's also a scene where Takabe is bringing Mamiya up on charges and they're both sitting together in front of all of the police chief higher ups those Takabe's bosses essentially and they they almost have this connection of Mamiya recognizes that all of Takabe's bosses are like idiots and don't really get what's going on and that Takabe is different and special compared to them in fact that'll be a, something he'll say a few times uh this idea that takabe is special in some way i don't know if you got this there almost seems to be a, a similarity between mamiya and fumi if not just solely because of the memory loss uh, I, I i did notice that but that was about the only connection i drew but it was kind of weird because uh we know that fumi has something wrong with her it's very vague as to what that is. Memory obviously seems to be the key thing, but it's funny because it's almost like it seems like an important detail, but one that's not explained very well, which I'm sure is intentional. Yeah. But. So that was the thing I was I've been pondering in my head is why is the problem that she has memory loss and the problem that Mamiya has also? Me well, I guess here's the question, Duke. Does Mamiya actually have memory loss? You know, at first I would have told you no, 
But here's what I... And this is where I'm going to have to explain a little bit more of the movie. The movie ends kind of with a standoff between uh, Takabe and Mamiya. And one of the things that uh, Takabe discovers is like an old, like... It's like a phonograph, is it not? Yeah. Of uh, a recording by... We found out earlier that there was somebody performing hypnotism... Back in the Meiji? or Yes. It is the Meiji, is how it's pronounced, uh, era. And... When you see the grainy video, he even makes, like, the X symbol. So, while Mamiya is a little different than the other victims, um, I almost wonder if Mamiya isn't in a state of, like, a a trance or almost a possession himself from viewing this record. I don't know if that seemed like... And you don't view records, you listen to them. (laughs) I don't don't know if that seems out of the blue or if you thought there might be a connection there, too. Yeah, so here's the part where we get into theories yeah this is a movie that invites theories uh as T- takabe has a friend who's helping him named sakuma and he is a psychologist type right and he also works with the police and stuff for, for one takabe has found that mamiya when he was a psychology student was learning a lot about mesmer and animal magnetism and well, hip- hypnotism. Now, Sakuma shows Takabe this, the the tape, and he brings up all these things about how it was seen as a cult. And Takabe asks what what mommy is actually doing, and Sakuma, as sort of just uh, throwing out ideas, is that he's some sort of a uh, emissary sp- spreading the ritual. Which was the original title of the movie was The Missionary. Missionary, there we go. That was the word. You might have said Emissary, too. But yeah, I. He, that's definitely some sort of role that Mamiya possesses. So, part of the reason why I think it's called Cure is... And playing off of the sort of occult nature that Sakuma brings up of the, the hypnotism is it, it's almost like... Mamiya is curing individuals of the things that they bury deep down inside of them, the resentment. For example, there's a police officer who Mamiya hypnotizes, and then the officer shoots his his partner. When asked about it, he said he didn't like the guy. So He was about the only person who, like, came out right away. Why'd you do it? Oh, yeah, I hated that dude. Exactly. So, and... It's funny, too, because I liked the scene where he kills him because compared to some of the others, it's so, like... Nonchalant? Just, yeah, you know, he just walks up. The guy's just out there getting on his police bicycle. Guy comes out, shoots him, and he's done with it. Mm-hmm. And then Mamiya also hypnotizes uh, the female doctor, and we actually get to see the conversation play out between them, and it's it's all about her resentment of other men. And... Well, and I guess that leaves you the question, too, because with the way that you see it from uh, the way Mommy uh, seems to, like, lock into it, uh, the question is, is are those things that are there or is those ideas that he's putting there? Those are those are also questions to be asked. But uh, And he has a really weird quote that I've been trying to kind of figure out where he says, like, all the things that are in, that were inside of him are outside of him now. With that whole symbol of the X that we... A seeing that video and then Mamiya later does at the end. I I feel like this is a a very uh, odd way of curing people, but he is he's fixing the problem of have of having these problems of resentment. One thing that would go well with that theory, and this is another big spoiler, um, at the end of the movie we see that Fumi has been killed, or has she? Unless it's that wouldn't be the first vision that uh Takabe's had but if you notice there's a scene where Takabe goes to the diner earlier and he barely touches his food you know he doesn't want any more coffee and he's just out of there and he seems miserable uh at the end we see Takabe and he's like wolfed down a plate he seems like he's in a good mood he gets another cup of coffee and then he possibly <laughs> hypnotizes this as a woman to go kill her boss yeah so again I think the whole spreading of the the ritual, I think 
the baton, whether willingly or unwillingly, got passed to Takabe when Takabe confronts Mamiya at this weird wooden lodge sort well, of thing. Well, and I wonder, too, whether it's passed because... Because Mamiya obviously senses that there's something in Takabe, and I'll mm-hmm. get into why I think that he senses that in a minute. But I wonder if it's because of the act of killing Mamiya, or if it's because uh, he then in turn witnesses the record. I don't even know what the record significance is 100%. No, my th- theory is that that's kind of the, uh, that, that it, Mamiya isn't the catalyst for all of this, it's the record. Mm-hmm. Because we know that there was a hypnotist in Japan in the Meiji era. Uh, we know that it's been mentioned many times before that hypnotism and the occult you know, are linked. And uh, that's not just a movie thing. I mean, if you look into Mesmer, it, uh, he it, was into yeah. some weird stuff. He's a real dude. You look into the Enlightenment and... You suddenly see a bunch of weird occult stuff you didn't know was there right. before. And we know that a girl that he cured of hysteria would go on to commit a murder of her own son, uh, similar to the ones that are taking place now in Tokyo at the time of the movie happening, mm-hmm. right? So I don't know if that awakens something in Mamiya or if this is really something that started in the Meiji era and is now starting again. Uh, Mm -hmm. by way of the record there's also the question of the movie is never explicitly supernatural in fact every supernatural thing in the movie i think could be explained away um if you're very very liberal with what can happen in reality yeah but uh there are times when things are shaking and it you could either say that's an earthquake or that is in some way connected to a Mamiya, or here's another connection between Fumi and Mamiya is at the very start of the movie, it actually opens up with Fumi reading Bluebeard, which I think gives credence to the, the thought that Takabe actually ended up killing her. Right. But just the table she's sitting at starts to shake and nothing else. So is it an earthquake? Is there some sort of connection there? I don't know. Well, I think the bigger thing, though, is the hypnotism itself, because uh, this isn't like a parlor trick. There, There is huge power with it to the point that, I mean, uh, Sakuma, in spite telling Takabe to not get too involved with, the, uh, with Mamiya, does, and he ends up having to handcuff himself to a pipe to avoid going out there and committing one of the murders. So, I mean, obviously this is a little bit more than uh, hypnotism as, you know, it exists. Uh, There's some sort of, like, power here, you know what I mean? And there's, uh, jumping off that, Sakuma earlier says that if, if a person believes killing is wrong under hypnotism, they won't kill anybody, which you could either say that Mamiya... Uh, has power to make people kill regardless, or this is people really aren't that good, and these people's morals against killing are maybe not as tight as they thought it was. And I think Sakuma, him and Takabe seem to have a a pretty good relationship. But But it's also contentious. It's also contentious, and when... There's a sort of weird, kind of trippy scene that shows Sakuma right after he visits Mamiya's apartment and I think also talks to Mamiya. And you you see Takabe in this sort of vision. So I think he was actually going to kill him, but to stop himself, he killed himself. Right. Well, though, another thing, too, that I think makes me convinced there's at least a little bit of supernatural element at play is Mamiya has the ability to just kind of see into people. Yes. Uh, he knows details that he shouldn't. He seems to know nothing, and then all of a sudden he knows, like, their life story and their, mm-hmm. you know, secret regrets and stuff. And I don't know. It's hard to tell, I guess, because there are scenes where he's asking, like, some probing questions, but it seems like almost like with Takabe, he almost, you know... Well, I guess we do know he got some of the information from the guard. Again, I, I it's it's like... Once again, though, for the hypnotism to be this powerful, you'd have to, to accept that there's no supernatural element, you'd have to ascribe a lot of power to hypnotism, uh, which it's never been shown to be capable of. And 
part of the way he hypnotizes is he has a lighter and he tells them to look at the lighter or water is involved. And every time water is involved, it's always moving. It, it's, yeah, it looks like it's almost being like drawn over. And at one moment, Takabe, when, when he is talking to Mamiya, sort of, I would say trying to interrogate him, but he gives a lot more information than... Uh, he's a terrible interrogator. Yeah, he's, he gives, he, he's mostly telling Mamiya about himself rather than interrogating him. But when he does get to a certain point, he grabs Mamiya's lighter and tells him to look at it and tries to talk to him. But coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, a rainstorm happens and water falls on the, the lighter. It didn't just... The, it soaks up into the ceiling... And then right drops above down. where the lighter is, exactly and starts to drip. So, like I said, I am in the camp that there's something supernatural happening, and I'm pretty firmly in that camp. You can only and, and do mental gymnastics around it. Something supernatural so happening, unless you're gonna go for some sort of crazy theory, like none of this is real. But I don't buy that. There's definitely some surrealist, definitely some surrealism to it. For one. We've mentioned that Takabe probably kills his wife. Takabe is somebody who's very... He's a, he's he's riding the struggle bus. And he does ride a bus in a, a vision sort of thing. <laughs> but, wow. Now we're really getting into the analysis. Now we are. Takabe um, rode a bus. What does this mean? <laughs> he's Continue. struggling. But he's torn between his mentally ill wife and his job. He loves his wife. He obviously cares about his wife. But he makes no bones about it. She is a burden. Yes. And there's one part where she leaves out dinner and it's an uncooked piece of meat. You know. And <laughs> yeah. he's he's struggling dealing with Mamiya. So it's Well, and he blames Mamiya and like as kind of a symbol of just everybody it's just, you know, un inability to just act right to just do what they're supposed to do and not be criminals and not drive him away from his wife yeah if if it weren't for takabe's duty to be a police officer and deal with people like mamiya he could be able to take care of his wife but she she's definitely a, a burden upon him so there's some obvious resentment and and struggle with her that he has and the the surreal moments don't really start until Takabe visits Mamiya's apartment. And in fact, I think that this is where the supernatural elements really take shape for me. Because there's almost some like American psycho type scene. The reason I say that is like, for instance, when he, he at one point he sees his wife hang himself or hang herself and even the one where we see Fumi dead, I think she did die. You know how American Psycho oh, these oh, things yeah, where he experiences real, something, real. and then he's all like <sighs> shaken because said thing did it happen? It, it was it real not? to him. He can't but... distinguish between reality. Exactly. Okay, I I get you now. It, that that was I just that's what I thought of when I saw mm -hmm. that was American Psycho. But no, when he goes to the apartment, that's when we go from the long takes to the sudden weird sort of subliminal quick cuts especially of that so he, shriveled monkey around he, his yeah. like shower head so in the, in the back of the apartment there is a bathtub and it's got a curtain when he pulls the curtain down there is what i can only describe as some sort of tortured monkey that... some sort of desiccated monkey that's had its limbs wrapped around in like a uncomfortable way and it it has a little x on its chest which first time i watched it i didn't even notice that i didn't notice that but this was my only viewing so far so you you see that and from the the rest of the movie on we start getting the weird sort of quick cut subliminal things and then of course he goes home and he sees his wife dead but she's not dead and other things of that nature but where it gets really surreal is there's a part where I believe he's at home. It gives a quick shot of him grabbing or 
somebody, probably him, grabbing a knife. And then him and Fume are on a bus in the sky. Right, and I think it's supposed to be, I forget what you call those, but I mean a cable car. Mm-hmm. But one thing I have wondered, it's shown because you know he's been affected by Mamiya. Mm-hmm. And you know that he grabbed a knife and just walked in there, but then he takes her to the... Uh, yeah, because she's still alive later. Right, he takes her to a... Um, uh, mental hospital. But I wonder if he if that's the thing that never happened. Him I going to the he, mental hospital with her? Right. I th- wonder if he didn't kill her in that scene. <sighs> and I, I'm not prepared to die on that hill. Mm-hmm. But that was a thing because it's almost like this dream like they're in this cable car because you can see like the clouds and stuff. It's mm-hmm. a very serene scene. And before he goes to the weird wooden lodge building, there's he's back on the cable car bus thing and he's by himself. And that could indicate that she is dead or maybe he killed her while she was in the hospital because it's practic- the, it's possible that he returned to do the deed because the the last shot we see of her is a quick shot of her just rolling down the hallway in a wheelchair but she's she's dead actually she looks like she's been dead for a while and she has the x cross right it doesn't uh, look like she was freshly killed so uh, i don't know well and i i had some other big thoughts but before i get to those uh, you said you had questions do you have another one you'd like to ask me before i go off on a tangent or a couple more even no i i think we answered my questions okay uh well to just vamp a little more Mm -hmm. i have a question and i think i have an answer for me though i in no way claiming it's the definitive answer but here's my question to you why is takabe special that is a very good question. Because I think that, because I, I watched this movie and I remember thinking, I understand the plot for the most part. I, l- I, I like it. I can sense that there's something there. But if you had asked me, like, what does all of this mean? I'm not sure I could still tell you, but I think one of the central ideas is that Takabe is special. Maybe because he's not a brainless salary man. It's sort of like, how I mentioned with the scene where they're together with their bosses. For one, he puts together the the hypnotism thing pretty, I guess not pretty quickly because there are a handful of murders that happen before the movie actually, you know, narratively starts. But he, he puts together that it's the lighter being used and that it is Mamiya, that it is hypnotism. So he's obviously very smart and... Man, that, that it is hard. Like, I'm not entirely sure, other I than think, that he is the main character of the script. <laughs> well, I think I have an idea, and you can tell me if I am, if you think that I'm just grasping here. But he really shows, Mamiya really shows interest in Takabe after Takabe's blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, because one thing Mamiya always asks people is he asks them about themselves, but a lot of times he asks, Who are you? And it's first it seems like it's because he doesn't know anything or he's just playing dumb. But he always seems kind of disappointed in their answers or like they don't know how to answer it. But Takabe has an answer. He doesn't answer it at first, but he then uh, he lets it all loose. He knows exactly who he is. He's a man who has cold at his job because it forces him to be, but it puts him at odds with his wife who he loves, but she's a burden, and he drives. Or she drives him crazy. I think Takabe, in part, is special because Takabe has self-awareness. Mm-hmm. Takabe knows who he is, while the others just kind of aimlessly shift. They don't even know how to begin to answer the question. You, you could say they are NPCs. <laughs> <laughs> Way to drag down the level of the conversation. But you know, in a way, I mean, it's, it's kind of correct. They are, they're just going through their lives not without examining their lives yes but takabe takabe in the pitiful state that he's in has a grasp of what that nature is Mm -hmm. now the other kind of thing to it is that perhaps takabe has some sort of potential for whatever this hypnotism power is the mamiya knows that 
the torch could be passed or that both of them together could be missionaries for whatever this cure is. Uh, because we do see later that Takabe, after, you know, his uh, thing with Mamiya, seems to possess then the same power Mamiya possesses. Well, here's the thing about the ending of the movie. Because it could be done, you could see it in multiple ways. And I think since the movie is so tense, at first you see it one way immediately. But Takabe is in this diner, he's finished his meal, and it pans away from him and it shows just people eating at a table and then two waitresses the waitresses have a small little talk one walks to one side of the building and grabs a knife and is walking in a she takes it and starts walking and then it, the movie just ends and you watch it and the first time i watched it i was like oh she's about to kill somebody she's grabbing that knife in a menacing way but uh, watching it the second time, it was, you know, it's perfectly normal and reasonable for her to be grabbing a knife and for her to be holding it that way. She she could literally just be doing her normal waitress things. You could Which see it either way of... Fair, but I think it's not for three reasons. One of them is cheating. <laughs> okay, well... Okay. Let's get... So the first thing is that I don't think the way it, the way that shows Takabe being natural and cheery there seems very unnatural. It, it, he's he's very much at peace. I mean, mind you, he's he had just... a radical shift mm -hmm. in peace. Plus, after that, we see that Fumi is probably dead. Yeah, and here he is at peace. So I think his newfound turnover is just disturbing rather than a happy ending mm -hmm. the third and this is why i say cheating because my english teachers would have never forgiven me for uh interpreting it this way <laughs> there was a scene that was not used because Ooh. kurosawa thought that it kind of was less powerful to show this of the woman butchering oh her body. okay so so and of course you might have said oh well i want to shift what i you know what i'm trying to say here but and that's why i say cheating because you know, this is not a scene anybody's given in the movie. I think that's because he thought the implication on its own was perhaps strong enough. Yeah, typically with movies, if there's a deleted scene, I'm I'm fine using those for interpretation. I mean, sometimes the scenes are removed. For... Well, then can I bring one more uh, outside of the movie source? Yeah. The actor who plays Takabe says that, uh, and about that scene, that there is uh, somebody with just no zero cares in the world like that is the scariest type of person. Uh huh. Which is, once again, feeds into my interpretation that, that we're not meant to think it's a happy ending. We're meant to think quite the opposite. Yeah. I, I see that. I think. How'd I do? You proud Sorry, of me? Sorry. Yeah, you did good. I, I lost my thought, though. <laughs> for, not bad for a rube. No, I, I think that's. Your interpretation is probably the most correct version of that. Now, granted, I haven't watched a lot of video essays. I haven't. I only looked up snippets of some interviews. So, and I've only seen this once. So, bear with me. Also, I'm more equipped for watching movies like The Giant Claw. <laughs> so, this is me trying to do my best. Yeah. No, I, I think I think that's a pretty good uh, analysis of the ending but i still feel a, a person could watch it and see it either way but if if you're you're really watching it and maybe really thinking about it just like how the supernatural element is debatable but at the end of the day there's no freaking way that it's not yeah there's no amount of mental gymnastics that, or this is an ultra unit alternate universe where hypnotism actually works <laughs> <laughs> not only works but works well yeah well you know, at the end of the day, Takabe was cured. <laughs> of something. He... <laughs> now, he might have picked up a new affliction. Hey, it he, it worked for him. It's going to work for everybody else. You got to stop <laughs> burying the desire to kill your neighbor. And you just got to... Actually, don't. I'm going to stop myself uh, before I, I, I tell you. Well, I will say cry. a planet that has been completely depopulated has no war. <laughs> and that is the cure for because war. uh the only desire a pent-up desire he seems to want to cure people of is not murdering the people <laughs> around them because nobody does anything else it's all murder 
I, actually, I do have a question for you. What did you think of the end of Mamiya? Because at, when Takabe goes to the the lodge, Mamiya shows up, and it's almost like we're about to get a villain monologue, and then Takabe just freaking pulls out a gun and just bang, bang, bang. Well, one, it was cheating, because Mamiya was going to tell me what the actual meaning of Kira was, and then they popped him. What Was he going to actually tell us, or was he just going to say... Well, Mamiya there's two things. ways. At first, when the scene first happened before we saw the end, uh, I kind of assumed that Takabe kind of knew whatever uh, he was going to say was going to be damaging or change Takabe. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, first interpretation was, you know, Takabe doesn't want to know. My new interpretation, I think, is Takabe knows exactly what Mami is going to say and doesn't care. It's his turn to have the torch. Well, for me, my interpretation was it literally does not matter what Mami was going to say, whether Takabe knew it or didn't know it. He was just sick of this case. He was just like he maybe had problems with his wife. He definitely had right. problems with Mamiya. And Part of, uh, he his... did not care about doing it by the letter of the law. This man is going to die now. Right. Well, and at first I thought, I was like, is this like a dirty Harry type thing? Like, the law is never going to be able to do something about this guy. I'm going to go ahead and pop him. But I think it had more to do with just personal hate. Yeah. No, he was sick of his crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was too. See, part of me was that was it wasn't anticlimactic but it almost felt like we had all of this build up and in the end mamia takes you know 10 steps and bang 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 but at the same time i too hate mamia right and, and you you want him because in his question asking and his sort of terrible attitude you really you feel like Takabe. You are frustrated by this man, and you want you you want to punch him in the face. And so, Takabe not even indulging him in a conversation, just shooting him, and not even just shooting him. He shoots him, and then Mami is on the ground, and Takabe just starts shooting him again, just making sure he is dead. Well, and it is kind of climactic in one sense that uh, I don't know if you felt like this, but mommy kind of in the beginning and the first two thirds of the movie feels invincible. Yeah. Like it's not like, and I don't mean necessarily mean in like a superhero kind of way, but he's obviously smarter than everybody else. He possesses some sort of power and even, and only Takabe is even beginning to guess at what's going on mm -hmm. except for maybe, you know, Sakuma. But by the time he has, he's it's already too late. He's been played. He's almost like, a Satan-esque character whispering temptation into people's ears and mm -hmm. manipulating the world around him. Which makes every scene where somebody is talking to him very edgy. And the, the first time Takabe, well, maybe not the first time Takabe talks to him, because the first couple times Takabe is very guarded and not letting... he Every question Mamiya asks him, he pretty much pulls a question back on him. Because he's trying to figure out things, and it's it, he won't be interrogated. But when he sort of breaks, and he does tell Mamiya all about who he is, that scene for me is, it's you're instantly in this feeling of oh no. So I, I was about to say, tell this man absolutely nothing. You, it's it's so over. Takabe is going to kill somebody now because he is about to be hypnotized. Right, and, you know, whether he was or not really is up for debate, though. Mm -hmm. uh, because, like I said, uh, Takabe is never the same after his meeting with Mamiya. Or that meeting with Mamiya. Right. I, I gotta say, so, just to skip ahead a little bit, this is a recommend, and my pitch for this movie is the reason you should watch this movie, unless you're easily disturbed, is because of, like, this discussion we just had. It reminds me of, like, being in English and having, like, an interesting, like, passage, and you're supposed to, like, you know debate or discuss its meaning this movie wants to be discussed it wants to be interpreted and i think there's enough substance there that rather than grasping at straws where there is nothing behind all of this i think there is something and i think it's that makes it worth talking about i've noticed with a handful of movies that have a lot of something like inception now i may be just a ignorant redneck here 
and Inception might be the most complicated thing in the world worthy of hours and hours of discussion. When I watched Inception, I thought this movie was pretty clear cut just as long as you were paying attention and a lot of the discussion was maybe not warranted. Now, I, I'm fine being wrong on that, but well, when I watched this, I, I didn't feel that way. Well, I'm going to take the other side of this too with Inception. I think Inception was a movie that mistook being complicated for being deep and added endless complications that weren't merited. It's almost, and I, this, this podcast does not the we hate Christopher Nolan podcast, but <laughs> I think with Inception, there's stuff put in there deliberately designed to draw discussion rather than the movie naturally has discussion. Right. This is the director went in with a vision, but one thing that's, I guess, distinctive to Kurosawa, I mean, not only him, but one thing that's part of his directing style is he doesn't like to explain everything to you. Uh, he takes show, don't tell very seriously. So at no point is he going to tell you why is everything happening or what are all of the mechanics of this immediately. He's going, you have to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, that's, and that's what makes the movie fun. I really like this movie. I think I've seen it five times now. Funnily enough, it's a movie that was a gamble buy. I had seen Kurosawa's movie Pulse, really loved it, was trying to find more J-horror, saw a trailer for this, and it looked really cool. Uh, but trailers can sometimes be deceiving. This was not a case of deception. This movie was great, and well, I, I would say it's worth owning. And I think a lot of people credit or uh, look at this as uh, this really is a movie that helped uh, start the J horror boom. Now, uh, this came out just before all of the stuff that would, you know, Dark Water, uh, The Ring, all of the things that would be associated with that, like, late 90s, early 2000s boom of just great horror movies coming out of Japan. Mm -hmm. So I guess we could maybe pivot into talking about actors and we only have four actors to really talk about, right? but I actually want to talk about Kurosawa because he's a little interesting to me. He started out making what I've heard called V cinema, which is just... I heard that term, but I didn't know what at all it meant. It's direct video. Okay. It's, it's what we would just call B movies. <laughs> really, you could call it almost C movies sometimes. Oh, uh, well, looking full moon pictures <laughs> let's just say that a lot of the movies that came out before cure i'm not sure if i would watch uh, uh, they seemed like the... some raunchy affairs well he made a lot of yakuza movies and he made what are called pink films which is just a euphemism for sexploitation i saw that they described them as erotic thrillers but yeah I'd it's just that soft core porn yeah it's just it's just sexploitation however during his v cinema days he did make a little film called sweet home now sweet home is special because it spawned a game for the famicom which for for normal people we call that the nes that's just what that was the japanese yeah it's the it. japanese nes and that game of the movie is sort of the godfather for all survival horror games and is pretty it's not so beloved here because i don't did it ever get an official american release no i believe it was only on the famicom because there were a couple like early horror films and or horror games in japan that never saw american releases uh, even clock tower which is well known now there was no official american release you had to you know, you have to go to, like, websites or find reproduction cartridges yeah. uh, or you can't play it. But it's my understanding that the, the game Sweet Home really pushed sort of the boundaries of what the Famicom could do and what a horror game was. The movie, interestingly enough, has been out of print since the first VHS release because of the producer's connection to Yakuza. <laughs> so, um... You can find it on archive.org. Other than that, it's uh, it's one of those very rare 
hard to find. Probably not findable outside of Japan. No, it's probably thing. something too. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not become a collector's piece with the, especially since uh, I know a lot of people do collect uh, VHSs and DVDs, and considering that it, he's a noteworthy director uh, who's known, you know, across the ocean, I would be surprised if people didn't snap those up. But then he made Cure. And Kira was sort of the shift from V cinema to, you could say, actual cinema. Cinema, I cinema. Would. <laughs> Look, I, I have a low bar for actual cinema, but yeah, looking just at a glance, you know, I don't consider softcore porn movies. Hey, some made, of those were, were just Yakuza video. films, you know, and not all of them were. I forget what one of them was called, but I, I remember just like reading seven the... perverts or something yeah. <laughs> one or something. I, I looked at that and I'm like, ah, interesting. Yeah. I didn't even click on the, the, the movie. I just saw the title. It's like, yep, I know what that is, but he made cure. And then after cure, he made pulse is classic J horror. It's also fantastic, but he didn't just make horror movies. He branched out into all sort of different kinds of genres he has a movie called tokyo sonata which is pretty good and it's more of a, a family drama i think this was the first instance of him getting to make, make the film he wanted to make mm -hmm. because this is like his first it's not it's obviously not his first movie but i feel like this is the first time he really got to sit in the director chair mm -hmm. yeah i mean he, he directed and wrote a lot of stuff but it's definitely a I wouldn't be surprised if it was sort of how it was in America in the 50s where we have the poster, the movie shows in two weeks, make a movie that fits the poster right. <laughs> and make it in two weeks. Well, and uh, one thing he did mention in a couple interviews was that he grew up on American horror movies and that he always wanted to direct one himself. So while this is, you know... Well, some people, I guess, would argue that this is a hor not a horror movie. I would say that if it's not horror, it's at the very least horror adjacent. Yeah, we get into that weird discussion of genres where, like, how music has 30 different thousand genres. I was about to say 30 genres only. There's not even that. There's not. There's 30,000 uh, genres probably of metal alone. Yeah, I meant to uh, put those together, but I, I split them. There are more <laughs> subgenres of metal than there are stars in the sky. Yeah. But at the end of the day, genres all made up. Yeah, the, when you get to the down to it, the genres are so, so painfully They're arbitrary. Looking. And you get into movie discussion and... It's like, oh, is it horror? Is it thriller? And what's the difference between thriller and horror and crime? And for me, it's it feels like I'm watching a horror movie. There are horrific scenes. There are no jump scares. I would but... say it's both horror and if I had to put another label on it, maybe even list this label first. It's a psychological Psych uh, thriller. Crime, psychological thriller, horror, whatever. It it fits the It's the, good. Yeah, it's good. And you mentioned how it's, it's bleak. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned how it came out before a lot of the, the big heavy hitters of J horror. And I think it really stuff like the ring Ringu, Juwan, the grudge, e even pulse. I knew about pulse before I knew about this movie. And I, as much as I love pulse, pulse is fantastic. This movie is arguably better than pulse. I think the others, because when the ring came out, if this movie maybe helped the genre take off, the ring cemented the genre mm -hmm. or maybe j the grudge. And, so and I think, I think pulse is better known probably because it came out after that kind of stuff. So the genre was firmly established. And I also think part of it has to do with the distribution. If I, I, I could be mixing up the history, but if I remember correctly, the Weinstein company started buying up the rights to a lot of these movies and releasing them over here in America and upon also releasing them over here in America on video, they also started remaking a lot of them. So that's why we have a, a remake with The Ring, and Pulse has maybe one of the worst remakes I have ever seen. <laughs> but it, I don't think Cure maybe got swept up. But it was also made before Kurosawa was a known entity to the average person in either america or japan or at least that's my interpretation of it because mm -hmm. i mean like you said most of his early movies were v cinema and i can't even imagine that in japan that was necessarily like you know 
I know some people who primarily directed those, but that's also because I like cult movies. I don't think the average person like knew about you know this director. Yeah, I'm. I don't know much about what the home video experience was in Japan versus how it was here in America, because it feels as though most home video or direct to video stuff that came here has some sort of cult status and uh, a lot of them are are pretty pretty beloved while and, and well you got to understand though that there's a lot that's pretty beloved but there were a gazillion of these things made and most of them probably nobody's ever thought about since probably not even the director even then though it seems like but that's there's, also there's like, a constant rediscovery of all these unknown films and I also they're think... all crap but people love them I think it helps now that we also have Shout Factory, but also that uh, Full Moon Entertainment uh, likes to make their entire uh, catalog available. Even the stuff that isn't Full Moon, there, there's just a lot there to be discovered. And I don't, I'm curious if there's that same love for direct to video in Japan as there was in America. Also, we mentioned this earlier, and I want to reiterate it now. This movie was critically very successful which is very strange for a movie we cover even the great movies we cover never get any love but this movie got lots and lots of love and that hasn't changed we, we've talked about the director i guess we should talk about our actors starting off we have takabe who is koji yakusho and for all i understand i think he was a known quantity before this yeah i'm not entirely sure so the reason I say that is Kurosawa was like expressed he, he was surprised him. and delightful delighted that he actually got him. So Kurosawa at least cared who he was. Spoiler, this will be the shortest actor section we've probably ever done because there's only four of them. We don't have a clue about ninety percent of the things they were in. However, with Yakusho, I did recognize a couple things. For one, he is in Pulse, although it's more of a cameo. He's he's in it for maybe three minutes. He's in 13 Assassins, where he's actually the lead, I believe, and that is a Takeshi Miike film. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard that it's very good. It's probably excessively violent. I think he has a small role in Memoirs of a Geisha. I feel like every Japanese actor who existed showed up in Memoirs of a Geisha because I feel like this is the third actor I've mentioned being in it. Every t if yeah, every time we mention somebody kind of like every British person ever got put in the Harry Potter series. <laughs> Am I wrong? The entire island got stuffed in there. Well, they had to. The one movie I haven't seen, I have no idea if it's significant at all. But really caught my eye was he was in a movie called Kamikaze Taxi, and I want to see it. Yeah, the movie that caught my eye was called Doppelganger, and it seemed, I guess... Did that... Kurosawa direct that one, too? He... I don't know. Because I remember reading... Because I don't... Th that caught my eye, too, which makes me think maybe I saw it more than once during my research. And I know that this was their first time working together, but... They worked together a bunch more times. Yeah, I know there's at least eight films. And Pulse and this one are the only ones that I know for sure. The the only thing that caught my eye about Doppelganger is that he plays himself twice. And wow, so he's like the Japanese Eddie Murphy, <laughs> like great great American actor Eddie Murphy, <laughs> great American. Yes, yes, that is exactly what you could take away <laughs> from this. And that is all I have to say on him. I'll do the next one. Then. Yeah, go for it. Another one that uh, I noticed. So, Mamiya was played by Masato Hagiwara. And all of these actors were in, like, tons of Japanese movies. The only one that sh jumped right out at me was Fukushima 50. But what did sh strike me was that he is also a professional Mahjong player. Really? Yes, like, top tier wins tournaments. You did a bit more research than I did on him. What's funny was when it came to the people, because there's going to be another one here, of less note was the movies, and what was of more note was... What they did outside. Right, well, f for another example real quick, Sakuma was played by Tsuyoshi Ujiki, and not only is he an actor, but he's also a rock musician, uh, where he does <laughs> vocals and guitar. Do you know what the band is? No, I couldn't find that. Uh, I'm sure if I dug a little harder, I could, but hmm. I just, <laughs> I thought, 
that's interesting. Yeah, the only thing I had for Hagiwara was that he was in a, well, he did a few voices on some animes that I, I had never heard of before. And uh, he was in a movie called Soup Opera, which made me, it made me make an audible nose breathe. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not even a funny movie, but I like the name Soup Opera. Yeah. I scrolled through his, his filmography probably three times just trying to find something that I could say, hey, this looks like a cult movie. It right. has a cool t I was looking for things with cool titles that I could say maybe this is good. And that was the only thing that really struck out to me. Well, and uh, just to be clear, these are not like people who were unknown all of these people were in movies before, and all of them would go on to be in tons of movies. So I'm sure to the average Japanese person, these would be names that they would know uh, if they, you know, left and went to movies. But uh, as for us, uh, we didn't want to waste too much time telling you the names of movies that you've never seen and will never see. Now, Fumi is an actress. I don't think she was in a ton of things, but she was in stuff. Uh, including, uh, and her name is uh, Anna Nakagawa, and... I wrote one thing down for her. I bet it was the same exact thing I wrote down. At the same time, Godzilla, Godzilla versus, versus King, King Ghidorah. Ghidorah. There we go. Yeah, baby. And, and, I mean, admittedly, that be... was the most notable thing I, you know, there. But if we're going to talk about something on the podcast, that's instantly getting yeah. mentioned. Any movie that has the word Godzilla in it is fair game for the podcast. I I don't know much about her other than... She actually passed away a while ago, and she was, I think she was only, she was in her late 40s, but. I think the other two actors, well, I know, I think all three of the actors we've mentioned already, but definitely uh, Mamiya and uh, Takabe's actors, uh, they're still acting. Yeah, they're still doing stuff. Uh, big stuff, too. And and Kiyoshi Kurosawa, I believe, is also still writing and directing. Right. So. I mean, and I don't think there's anything we could really say about him now that we haven't already said. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the actor section. Uh, apologies that we don't have more to say. It is considerably harder to talk about actors outside of the U.S. filmmaking machine. It's sometimes easier when they're genre actors, like in some of the Godzilla movies. Mm -hmm. You know, we have. But yeah, this is. Uh... Look, we can't. We can. We've probably mangled most of the names you know we're doing our best and we didn't mention this but uh no, nothing really stood out to me that sakuma's actor had been in other than in, he was in a common writer it was either a movie or a show some iteration of the character he wasn't i think he's just like a bit part he's not important but that i just saw common writer and that was in the, the category of things to mention. But it's okay. He's cool. He's in a band. Yeah. I think we've been at this for quite a while. Yeah, now. I, I think, think this is where we need to wrap up. Yeah. Apologies if this was a, a more rambling episode. Or, there. you know, this is a, this is movie's a little headier than our normal fare. And uh, we just aren't used to having to think. Uh, but don't worry here. For all of you here who are like, oh, this episode was a little much for me. I got one for you. Oh, oh boy, what are what are we watching? Okay, you know all the IQ points we just gained? <laughs> you can just throw those away because the next movie we're doing is Ega. So what's the name of that actor? The the Jaws from James Bond who's in it? Oh crap, I know this. It's uh, Richard Keel. Yeah, yeah, the Richard Keel classic, probably his most famous performance. Got so if you guys are ready for some exciting caveman action, tune in next week. And while you are waiting feel free to leave a a comment like and subscribe Find... top five cavemen movies leave them in the comments go man i can only think of <laughs> maybe two movies featuring caveman wow i bet pathetic. there's more um pathetic i <laughs> think thank you for all of the engagement you give us and for watching this episode Oh. <laughs> and for the three of you out there who are our comment warriors, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> we see you every episode. You are seen. You are seen. Uh, but thank you for watching, and uh, goodbye. And keep it cold.